Alright, welcome back to another episode of Life of Linux and the PlayStation 2. Now, in the last episode we did some audio and video streaming that really put the system under a decent load, so in this episode I wanted to explore some of the issues I've faced during the making of this series. So, let's have a look at a few of the issues and see what we can do to get this uh, PlayStation 2 purring again. So join me in the fourth episode, The Dark Side. Uh, where we will be opening this machine up and having a look at the dirty, nitty gritty innards of a 20 year old console. Now, there's not much point in me doing a tear apart of this console. There's plenty of videos done by a lot of great YouTubers that uh, do that. But, take me at my word that it was very dirty, grimy, and in need of some TLC. Now, as I mentioned, I was having some issues with the hard drive and network adapter, and what's happened is, is this uh, F10 or PS10 fuse here for this console uh, has blown. So when you check it with continuity, there is no continuity there. So we'll take this one off, the donor console I've got, that's got a lot of issues, and we'll use it to fix up one of my other consoles. So I'm, I'm using rosin here. Uh, before anyone crucifies me, I know it's not the best stuff, but that's just what I have on me at the moment for the gear I use. So we'll get this uh, fuse back onto PS10, and then I'm going to put these in the ultrasonic cleaner to get a lot of this um, isopropyl you see all over the board there. It looks, it looks pretty messy there, but trust me, once, once it goes through the ultrasonic cleaner, you're not even going to know. It's going to look brand new. Um, one of the coolest machines I have, actually. So, put them in the ultrasonic cleaner for a couple of hours, and then we'll put it in the uh, oven to dry them out at 105 degrees centigrade. Now, the DVD ribbon cable was looking pretty sketchy, but after cleaning some of the corrosion off and checking it uh, for continuity with my multimeter, maybe this was enough to you know, solidify those connections again. So, everything seemed okay here. So while I had this all apart, I thought this might be a good time to finally upgrade the IDE adapter to a more modern SATA SSD drive. And like it's getting harder to find compatible Seagate drives that are like, you know, between say 40 and 100 and something gigabytes. Uh, there's a lot of those drives, mechanical drives, are starting to fail. So we might do this and try a solid state drive or something else. And while I had the uh, power supply out, I was having a quick, just a quick look over it, and after the rectifier and the transformers, there's the main two 12-volt uh, DC power rails that connect to the main board. So that's two um, positive and negatives at 12 volts coming straight into the board. So I was thinking you could possibly change this power supply into some kind of battery bank, and I do have a lot of old uh, 18650 batteries around that I could maybe uh, you know weld a pack together, and we could make this a chargeable sort of PlayStation 2. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. Right. Back into Black Rhino Linux here and we left off with a little bit of code being compiled, uh, just a Hello World app uh, done by GCC and uh, Black Rhino Linux does come with a few basic libraries, although it's, it's nothing up to date say from like a server from uh, Debian or Gen 2 or anything like that. Um, so my thoughts were here to download VLC or some source code of it and see if we can't compile it. Now the live DVD does have a SDK for this release of Black Rhino Linux but like as I said it's, it's not as easy to set up as you would just like apt-get just from the Debian server to install like you know the Allegro library or the SDL library. Um, but Black Rhino Linux comes with transmission, so I wanted to use transmission to download uh, VLC via a torrent to make sure that's working. And try it as I might, it just did not want to work. It wouldn't connect to the nodes or, or whatever torrent files use. I, I don't really use torrents, I haven't used torrents in a long time. But uh, it just wouldn't work. And I, I, I tried this same uh, torrent file on my um, Mac and my PC and it works fine so I just didn't want to do it in this version of transmission she's probably a bit outdated so uh, we might have to come from a different angle here 
and um, look at leaving Black Rhino Linux for the time being and setting up a better uh, development environment. And like, I, I even went through Netstat here to, to see if I could get any uh, information, and it didn't really help. So I'm think my, my thoughts here are is we've pretty much come as far as we're going to get with Black Rhino Linux. I mean, I can install the libraries from the DVD, and I, I might even do that anyway, and install. Um, say Debian on another drive, maybe on a new SATA drive and get that set up. So we might just start doing that I think. So we'll, we'll leave Black Rhino Linux behind for now and um, I just want to talk a little bit about why I want to go over to Debian and it's just easier to install the development environment and libraries and stuff. So games like Johnny Voices Drunk Driving 3, this is just a pet project of mine. Um, where you're a guy driving through the outback of Australia running over the roadkill and uh, another real-time strategy game I've been working on, Dead Seas um, is another game that I'd love to port these over to the PlayStation 2 because they don't require any hardware acceleration or anything like that so I should be able to get these to compile uh, under Debian Linux um, Black Rhino Linux I probably could too if I downloaded all the uh, libraries and stuff from the live DVD but but let, let's let's start fresh. We'll, we'll start fresh with Debian, uh, which I've already downloaded. Now I have actually tested this uh, prior to this video. Um, I've downloaded all the files here uh, just to make sure it works. So I actually got it working off the hard drive once, but then I couldn't get it to work again for some reason. And the um, VM Linux version 11 kernel uh, doesn't actually boot up on my PlayStation. I think it's for a newer console to run off a USB. So there's actually another um, version of the 2.6 kernel. So we'll unpack all this stuff onto um, the second partition and we'll boot it up. And there's nothing special required as such to get Debian working. Um, but you may recall when you uh, format your file system that uh, Debian actually needs the dash I128 um, for its, uh, what do you call it, I think the, the word off the top of my head right now, but it's just one of the partition settings for the uh, byte size or whatever it is. Um, so we'll boot up here. Now, I just want to show you with this other kernel, this VM Linux uh, version 11 kernel, um, and some of the other settings here. So if we go to here, so HDA3 I think is wrong. So this won't actually boot from the um, hard drive, it won't boot. I th I'm pretty sure from memory it's got to be SDA1 or SDB. I think SDB2 is the USB and SDA1 and is the IDE hard drive. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's been a while, it's been a few months. So next time we will get into Debian Linux. It's going to be a cool adventure. So. Uh, thanks for following again today, and I will see you guys on the next video. Ciao.